。改めまして、えー、小笠原博之です。よろしくお願いします。えー、I'm Hiroki Ogasawara of Kobe University. Since 2013, when Tokyo was chosen as a host city, I've been voicing against holding the Olympics. I think that's why I am in charge of moderator today. It's just only a month or so before the Olympics. However, we, have, we heard strong voice calling for its cancellation from inside and outside of the country. Many people in the world from various positions, in many ways, questioned, repeatedly questioned the opening of the games. I'm sure today's kind of an emergent lecture and talk will deepen our understanding of the issues we face around the games and clarify what to do from now on. In this pandemic, IOC, JOC, organizing committee, and Tokyo Metropolitan Government, Japanese government, and Prime Minister Suga are forcing to hold the games. However, the voice against it was already shown by over 400,000 signatures collected in the campaign started by Mr. Utsunomiya. With this, the researchers criticizing 2020 Tokyo Olympics wished to invite Ms. Mr. Jules Boykoff, well-known researcher and a representative voice against 2020 Tokyo Olympics, in order to have a chance to listen to his view on the present situation. For this purpose, we organized the executive committee and planned this meeting. Many of his books are translated into Japanese. The latest one <coughs> was just published. It's titled Non Politics Inside the Fight Against Capitalist Mega Sports in Los Angeles, Tokyo, and Beyond. Can you see this? So, to,、uh, Ms. Tomoko Wada, Ms. Emiko Inoue, Ms. Tobi Kobayashi, As well as Mr. Ms. Satoko Itani, Mr. Tetsu Ugai, and myself, Ogasawara, worked translation and a commentary of the book. As you can read from the book, Mr. Baikoff sharply criticizes not only Tokyo Olympic, but also Olympics itself. Mr. Baikoff, thank you very much for、uh, coming to Japan. It's a great pleasure for us to have you here. I'd like to deeply thank you in behalf of the member of the executive committee. And I also thank Mr. Utsunomiya, who is going to talk a little bit about the petition and talk with Mr. Baikoff today. Well, next, let me introduce the speakers briefly. First of all, Mr. Baikoff. Juice Barkov is a professor of politics and government at Pacific University, located on the west coast of the US. He's also a former professional soccer player and h a v e played for US Olympic team in Barcelona in Olympics in 1992. Not only academia,、uh, his research focuses on US politics, the politics of sports, mass media politics, social movements, and environmental politics. Not only academia, he's quite active in media appearance and SNS, including Japanese papers and TV programs. He has published several books. His most recent books have been translated, as I introduced before, and also he published. Power Game, a political history of the Olympics, is also published from Hayakawa Shobo. Another, Mr. Otsunomiya, he's a lawyer. He has been active to help the people suffering from multiple deaths. 
He was also involved in many activities such as uh, related to the poverty issues in the society, such as anti-poverty network. Thinking Olympics in pandemic is a calamity for already exhausted clinical environment and the poor. In this May, he started the petition calling for Olympic cancellation. In a month, over 420,000 signatures were collected, which gathered attention from the media at home and abroad. Mr. Utsunomiya and Mr. Barkov together criticize the Olympics focusing on anti-poverty. So today they met and they are going to talk today. We like to make it a significant start to raise a voice against holding the Olympic. Well, we will move to the next program from Mr. Utsunomiya. We are gonna have an explanation about the petition that he started. Mr. Utsunomiya, are you ready? Hi, everyone. My name is Utsunomiya Kenshi. I will start my presentation. In this brief presentation, I would like to talk to you about the following three points. Background of the petition against the Tokyo Olympics, current situation of infections in Japan, and lastly, COVID-19 countermeasures distorted by the Tokyo Olympics. So first, uh, please let me explain the circumstances surrounding this petition calling for the Olympics to be canceled. When I ran for the governor of Tokyo last year, one of my campaign promises was to demand the IOC to cancel the games if infectious disease experts judged it dangerous to it was dangerous to hold the Olymp Olympic Games. Since then, the Japanese epidemic situation has never settled down as the second state of emergency was announced on January 7, 2021, followed by the third state of emergency on April 25th. The latter was declared only three months before the Olympics. Therefore, I decided to organize a petition for the Olympics cancellation on change.org. We named a petition cancel Tokyo Olympics to protect our lives. Since the campaign's launch on May 5th, the, the number of signatures gathered has increased at a blistering pace from the beginning. We created several versions of this petition, such as English, French, and German ones, and gather signatures from more than 100 countries. Since it started a month ago, we have received more than four, 420,000 signatures, which is the largest number in Japan's change.org history, according to the site. The petition has several recipients, the Tokyo governor, Yuko Koike, Japan's prime minister, Yoshihige Suga, um, president of Tokyo Olympics and Paralympic Games organizing committee, Seiko Hashimoto, minister of Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games, Ta Tamawaya Marukawa, and president of International Olympic Committee in Parsons, Thomas Bach, and at last president of International Paralympic Committee, Andrew Parsons. We submitted the first petition letter to four recipients in Japan and emailed as, as well as sending a post, postal mail to requests for cancellation of the Olympics and Paralympic Games to the IOC and IPC. We plan to submit the petition repeatedly until the Olympic and Paralympic Games is finally canceled. Next, I would like to discuss the current situation in Japan. As you may know, 10 prefectures in Japan are now under the third state of emergency and eight prefectures are placed under less restrictive pre preventative measures, preventive measures. Uh, it was said that the hospitals in Japan had so many hospital beds, but these hospitals are generally small or medium sized so that they are not available in the epidemic situation like we are facing now. Therefore, the number of hospital beds and other medical resources available for preventative, me preventative measures against infections are far less than those in other developed countries. For example, the number of doctors per capita 
was 28th among the 38 OECD countries. Moreover, there are only one fourth of ICU specialists in Japan compared to Germany. For this reason, the, me the medical system in this country is now exhausted all the more for its initial lack of sufficient resources. Under the state of emergency, we have several regional healthcare systems on the verge of collapse or effectively collapsed. Indeed, in Osaka, the regional healthcare system has collapsed. Many patients died at home while waiting to, to be sent to hospitals. As for Tokyo, the healthcare system is also under strain. It is under these circumstances that the hospital in Tachikawa in Tokyo, posters put, are put on walls or windows saying medical capacity has reached its limit, stop the Olympics. The National Hospital Workers Union also called for the Olympics to be canceled. Haruo Ozaki, chairperson of the Tokyo Medical Association, issued a statement on May 27th stating, if the current situation continues, it will be difficult to hold the Olympics. And even if it were to be held, there will be no audience at all. At last, Shigeru Omi, president of the official coronavirus advisory panel in a close relationship with the government, has finally broken the silence. On June 3rd, he declared that it was it is not normal to hold the Olympics during a pandemic. Restrictive breathing measures. It was said that the hospital in Japan had many hospital beds, but these hospitals are generally small or medium sized, so that they are not available in the epidemic situation like we are facing. However, Therefore, rather than listening to the opinions of experts, the cabinet of Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga has been ignoring them. Prime Minister Suga and the people concerned just repeat, we try our best to hold the Tokyo Olympics safe and secure without explaining what kind of measures it will implement and under what circumstances the government will stop the Tokyo Olympic Games. Without clear and definitive measures, it is natural that people become more anxious and more inclined to postpone or stop the Olympics. On the international level, the IOC president, Thomas Bach, has re said recently, we have we have to make some sacrifices to make this possible. While John Coates, an IOC vice president, said the Olympics would go ahead even if Tokyo is under a state of emergency. Clearly, these statements trample on a nation's sovereign authority, but Prime Minister Suga did not object to them. It is worth noting that his approval rate has significantly dropped since the start of his government for almost all the COVID prevention measures taken failed to curb the curses, uh, cases of new infection. As the next generation general election is to be held before this October, Suga is working to increase his approval rate by holding the Olympics games uh, by any means necessary this summer. However, we must say such political decisions should not be allowed to put people's lives in danger. Finally, I would like to explain how the Olympic Games have distorted Japan's COVID-19 countermeasures. For the past year, the government and the Tokyo Metropolitan Government have constantly manip manipulated the measures to deal with COVID-19 situations. Last March, when the coronavirus, is, the coronavirus was already spreading throughout the Tokyo city, the government did not conduct enough testing because of the Olympics were coming up this summer. As a result, the virus spread throughout Japan and the government was forced to issue the first state of emergency in April. While infections had begun to rise again in early March, the government terminated the second emergency declaration midway through for the Olympics. After that, the virus spread rapidly and, and a third emergency declaration was made. Initially, it was destined to end only two weeks after its declaration in order to co coincide with box visit to Japan. Infections did not settle at all and the declaration was extended twice more. Once again, the lives of Japanese citizens were sacrificed due to the government's dis disorganized policies. And now it is said that more powerful Indian variant is spreading throughout the country. The Tokyo Olympics will almost certainly trigger a fifth wave of the infection if the Olympics and Paralympic Games are held under the flawed infection control me measures. Currently, the government is rushing to promote vaccination. However, the vaccination rate is, in Japan is extremely low compared to the other developed countries, and the number of people who have received two doses of vac va vaccination has yet to reach 10%. 
Even the vaccination of the elderly who make up one third of the population is not certain to be completed by the end of July. Therefore, it will be impossible to achieve mass immunity before the Olympics. In addition, the Tokyo Olympics will bring together a huge number of people in one place. The number of people involved from overseas alone are estimated at 90,000. Besides, there will be more, more than 200,000 Japanese staff coming to organize the games. Additionally, Prime Minister Suga is plan still planning to hold the event with spectators. Since the government will not do not do so. The government, sh the Tokyo Shimbun has made its own estimate that under the current conditions, the total number of spectators would be about 3.1 million. It is impossible to provide a safe and secure environment for all of them. In other words, holding the Olympics now will put the lives and livelihoods of many people at risk. Since the Olympics is an international event, there is a risk that many viruses will spread in Japan and then spread around the world. Le Monde, a major French newspaper, has called the Tokyo Olympics a festival of mut mutant strains. And there is even a danger that the Tokyo Olympics will become a global event of infection, not just in Japan. The threat of expansion of the coronavirus and the crisis of public health are not the problem Japan only. Dr. Tedoros, Director General of the WHO, declared that the pandemic is not just finished yet, just yet. Uh, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said on May 24th that the world is now at war against COVID-19. Under these circumstances, it is sure that there are many athletes who cannot participate in the games. Regrettably, the, conditional, the conditions are not equal to the athletes around the world. So I don't think the holding the Olympic and Paralympic games now makes any sense. And for this very reason, Mr. Suga can't help using meaningless words like overcome the division made by COVID-19 or to give dream and hope to justify holding the games. I would like to conclude that under the current infectious state situation, we must cancel the Olympic and Paralympic games and only the cancellation can be true to the spirit of the Olympic charter. That's all by me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tsunomiya. Perfectly timed. So many have signed the petition and so many have supported what you do. And the government has used the Olympics as an excuse to, for, to boost their popularity. Mr. Mr. Boykoff, are you ready for your lecture? If yes, then please turn your camera off and you may start. Thank you very much. First, I would like to thank the organizers of this event for all the work they did to make this happen. Also, it is my great honor to share the virtual stage with Kenji Utsunomiya, I also want to thank everyone who is here tonight. I look forward to the conversation. As the coronavirus continues to throw the Tokyo 2020 Olympics into disarray, one might forget that in some ways, the games have been a cascade of calamities from the very beginning. In 2013, when Tokyo's Olympic bidders were trumpeting their plans for the 2020 games, in an effort to secure the votes of International Olympic Committee members, they faced a significant hurdle. The triple whammy disaster at Fukushima, the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown of March 2011. This was generating skepticism that Japan would be able to host the Olympics in Tokyo. 
To calm the nerves of voting IOC members, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe directly addressed the situation. He said, quote, some may have concerns about Fukushima. Let me assure you, the situation is under control. The Tokyo Games would even be dubbed the Recovery Olympics, a nod to using the mega event to quicken the pace of relief in the affected regions. Meanwhile, in Japan, people with direct knowledge of the situation were not nearly as optimistic. Marine ecologists and local residents in the Fukushima region unequivocally contradicted the prime minister's claim that radioactive water gushing out of the Fukushima plant and into the Pacific Ocean was being contained. A few years later, former Japanese premier Junichiro Koizumi was blunt, quote, Mr. Abe's under control remark was a lie. Six years later, when I visited Fukushima in July, 2019, with a group of scholars, journalists, and community activists, locals were still seething about the prime minister's claim that everything was under control. In Fukushima, we encountered a significant gap between the Recovery Olympics rhetoric the Tokyo Olympic bidders were using and the grim on the ground reality of a region still in need of material support. Satoko Itani, a professor of sport, gender, and sexuality studies at Kansai University, called the Recovery Olympics tagline ironic since quote, the money and human resources they are spending in Tokyo could help people who survived the 2011 disaster and make communities more resilient to future catastrophes. Instead, Itani noted, quote, this Olympics is literally taking the money, workers, and cranes away from the areas where they are needed most. Even though the Japanese government did not have the Fukushima situation under control in 2013, the International Olympic Committee selected Tokyo over Istanbul and Madrid. IOC President Jacques Rogue, a Belgian yachtsman, orthopedic surgeon, and the eighth leader of the International Olympic Committee exalted Tokyo as, quote, a safe pair of hands. But from the beginning, this safe pair of hands has bobbled the Olympic torch. If Abe's under control comments were a disingenuous effort to secure the Tokyo Games, the Recovery Games slogan extended the cruel lie. Another factor worth noting, even though it is barely discussed today, is that the original sin of the Tokyo Games. There are serious allegations of bribery against key players on Tokyo 2020's bid team that are being pursued by prosecutors in France. Members of the International Olympic Committee were not only allegedly open to bribes and the wishful thinking of Prime Minister Abe, but they also brought a remarkable confidence. It is even fair to call it arrogance to their approach to the Tokyo Games. What began as an embrace during the bid stage quickly turned into a vice grip once the IOC handed the games to Tokyo. When Washington Post columnist Sally Jenkins noted, quote, Japan didn't surrender its sovereignty when it agreed to host the Olympics, end quote, she was technically correct. But the state of exception brought on by the Olympics chips away at Japan's sovereignty as it does with all Olympic hosts. Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga made this clear when under pressure to cancel the Olympics, he said the IOC has the authority to decide. He is right. The prime minister is relatively powerless. Just look at the host city contract that Tokyo signed with the International Olympic Committee. As, the Olympic, as is the Olympic custom, the city of Tokyo and Olympic organizers made themselves responsible for cost overruns as well as all damages, costs, and liabilities of any nature, direct and indirect, that emerge from a breach of any part of the agreement. And yet, the IOC may, in its sole discretion, take legal action against Tokyo and local organizers 
as the International Olympic Committee deems fit. The contract also states that if an irreconcilable disagreement agrees within the Olympic family, as they call it, then such dispute shall be submitted to the International Olympic Committee for final resolution. As many commentators in Japan have pointed out, the host city contract is essentially an invitation for the International Olympic Committee to colonize Japan during the Olympic period. In a sense, the dictates of the host city contract reduce Prime Minister Suga to a local colonial magistrate. On top of this inconvenient truth, powerful members of the International Olympic Committee began piling up insulting remarks. President Bach of the International Olympic Committee stated, the Japanese people have demonstrated their perseverance throughout their history. And it's only because of this ability of the Japanese people to overcome adversity that these Olympic games under these very difficult circumstances are even possible. To state the obvious, that comment did not go over very well with you all in Japan. Then when John Coates was asked whether the Olympics could proceed even though Tokyo and other areas of the country were under a state of emergency, he said, yes, the answer is absolutely yes, as Utsuno Miya-san just pointed out to us. Then Richard Pound of the International Olympic Committee insisted that barring an Armageddon, the Tokyo 2020 Olympics will go ahead. In Japan, these comments were the equivalent of throwing jet fuel on a bonfire of disgruntlement. More than 80% of the population does not want the Olympics. IOC arrogance surely did not help. While the preparations for the Tokyo 2020 Olympics have been a debacle, in some ways, we're not witnessing Tokyo problems so much as Olympic problems that are imported to each host city. Next, I'd like to run through four central problems that plague all Olympics in various degrees. I will offer examples from recent Olympics, and I'll show how all four problems are surfacing in Tokyo. The four negative externalities associated with the Olympics are one, overspending. Two, the militarization of the public sphere. Three, gentrification and displacement. And four, greenwashing. So the first trend is escalating costs. The Olympics have become notorious for having a price tag that spirals upward over time. During the bid process, Olympic supporters understate costs only to have them increase significantly by the time the games are staged. University of Oxford uh, researchers analyzed Olympic games between 1960 and 2020, for which reliable data exist, and found that every single Olympics ran over its initially stated budget with an average cost overrun of 172% in real terms, a notably higher markup rate than other mega projects. Examples of Olympic overspending abound. The London 2012 Summer Games price tag started at 3.8 billion, but ballooned to 18 billion. A Sky Sports investigation calculated the actual price tag, including necessary infrastructure projects, the, uh, to be more like $38 billion. The Sochi 2014 Winter Olympics went from $12 billion to $51 billion, making the price of those games higher than all previous Winter Olympics combined. The Rio Olympics in 2016 went from $12 billion to $20 billion. The cost of the 2018 Pyeongchang Games doubled from around $6 billion to $13 billion. There are opportunity costs too, Money spent on the Olympics are not spent on local causes like housing, education, and human rights. Tokyo follows in this ignominious tradition. The Tokyo Games were originally slated to cost $7.3 billion, but the price tag has escalated to around four times that, according to a government audit in Japan. 
postponement added billions more, bringing the total to around $30 billion. These jaw-dropping cost overruns, well over 200%, not only exceed the historical average for Olympic overspending, but make Tokyo 2020 the most expensive summer games to date. The safe pair of hands ended up being extraordinarily expensive hands too. The Olympics are a stark example of trickle up economics. For instance, Tokyo 2020 enabled local developers to leverage the Olympic state of exception to relax long time height restrictions on building in the neighborhood around the national stadium. In 1970, city officials in Tokyo instituted a 15 meter height limit in part so it could not build higher than Meiji era imperial structures. However, in 2013, to accommodate the new national stadium design, the height restriction was erased and replaced with an 80 meter limit. This regulation made possible by the Olympics pried open urban terrain for well-positioned developers. In short, capitalism trumped imperial tradition. A second clear trend with the Olympics in the 21st century is the militarization of public space. This very much relates to spending on the games and directly ties to human rights issues before, during, and after the mega event. Local security and police forces use the Olympics like their own private money pump, leveraging the games induced state of exception to secure all the weapons, equipment, and special laws they would struggle to obtain during normal political times. Terrorism is real, of course, but even when terrorists don't show up, activists do, and police have an array of weapons at their disposal to ensure the sports spectacle proceeds apace. Moreover, security officials often conflate terrorism and activism. For example, the Rio Bid Book contained a section titled Activist Terrorist Risks, even though it conceded that the risk to the games from protest action and domestic terrorism was low. The bid specifically identified issue motivated groups that are concerned with indigenous rights, environmental or anti-globalization issues. The conflation of terrorism and activism was clear. A similar, a similar dynamic occurred in London, where the head of security listed protests as a key risk to the Olympics alongside terrorism, organized crime, and natural disasters. The militarization can be breathtaking. For the London 2012 Olympics, surface-to-air missiles were fastened onto the rooftops of residential apartment buildings. Members of the military were ubiquitous in the streets after they were called upon to provide security when the private firm G4S failed to provide trained staff that they promised. In Russia, whip-wielding Cossacks took to the streets to preserve order, attacking the art activist collective Pussy Riot when they performed in public space. In Rio de Janeiro, 85,000 security personnel were put to work, double the number in London. Pyeongchang installed extra CCTV cameras and facial recognition systems while ramping up their supply of tactical drones. The games featured 60,000 security officials per day, including 50,000 from the military, making this Olympic security force one of the most militarized ever. Police don't box up these special weapons and return them to the manufacturer after the games. Rather, they're folded into everyday policing, becoming the new normal of militarized securitization. The Tokyo Olympics will bring facial recognition systems to every Olympic venue, although there are reports surfacing in the Japanese press that it will not be used since overseas spectators are no longer allowed. We shall see. Various levels of government in Japan 
have long collaborated with technology companies to develop artificial intelligence-driven securitization measures through public-private partnerships. The Tokyo Metropolitan Police are no strangers to biometric surveillance technologies. However, the Tokyo Olympics promises to be the first ever application of large-scale large security that is firmly rooted in artificial intelligence technologies. ALSOC, Japan's largest private security firm, has prepared a fleet of robots to surveil the games. These robots will patrol crowds, deploying an emotional visualization system designed to sniff out jitters from Olympics goers. ALSOC was born out of the 1964 Olympics, but is poised to cash in at the 2020 games. It is coordinating its efforts with more than a dozen other private security firms. As with previous Olympics, the Tokyo 2020 games come with serious civil liberties concerns. In 2017, Japanese legislators rammed anti-terrorism legislation through the parliament, justifying the rushed nature of its passage by asserting the need to securitize the Olympics. The legislation added hundreds of new crimes to Japanese law, including offenses such as sit-ins to oppose the construction of new apartment buildings. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Privacy said Japan's government had used fear to push through defective legislation. Such legislation and the biometric technologies it enables, perhaps especially facial recognition software, can peddle racial bias while simultaneously nudging Japan down a surveillance state slippery slope. A third global trend in the context of the Olympics is the displacement of everyday working people. More specifically, the games spur both forced eviction and gentrification. The general trend is that the global south sees more eviction while the global north experiences more gentrification. Beijing evicted a whopping 1.5 million people to make way for the 2008 Olympics. Rio displaced 77,000 people. But amid the numbers, one can lose sight of the fact that real people are affected. For example, in Rio de Janeiro, there's Eloisa Helena Costa Bertu, an Afro-Brazilian practitioner of the Candomblé religion, who was evicted from Vila Autodromo, a working class favela along the Jacare Pagua Lagoon that was demolished to make way for a parking lot next to the media center for the 2016 games. Here's Heloise Elena right here. Her whole life was overturned, including her religious practice, since the lagoon was home to her orisha, or deity. She invited me and my family to a ceremony where she said goodbye to her home. She is an incredibly strong a, a, a person, and she continues to speak out against the perils of the Olympics during the 2016 games. You can see here at an event that I was with her at, both speaking at Rio. The Olympics has also displaced residents in Tokyo. The aforementioned change in zoning laws cleared a political path for the elimination of public housing units. More specifically, residents from the Kasumi Gaoka apartment complex, which sat in the shadow of the new Olympic stadium, were forced from their public housing and relocated into different communities across the metropolis. Of the 370 residents who were evicted, 60% were over 65 years old, and many were widows in their 80s and 90s. Remarkably, two women who lost their homes in Kasumi Gaoka were also displaced by the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. Meanwhile, the Japanese Olympic Committee built a glassy tower nearby, and high-end, high-rise apartment buildings have also been built, benefiting from the new zoning codes. In short, due to the Olympics, developers, landlords, and gentrifiers are profiting at the expense of the poor and elderly. Fourth Olympic trend is greenwashing, making big environmental promises that lack meaningful follow through. In the 1990s, the International Olympic Committee made sustainability a new arrow in its rhetorical quiver. 
Yet, a chasm emerged between green word and deed. In other words, the Olympics facilitate greenwashing. For example, at the London 2012 Olympics, organizers created a new category of corporate sponsor, sustainability partners. Believe it or not, they included BP, the petroleum company infamous for hemorrhaging oil into the US Gulf Coast. An independent watchdog, the Commission for a Sustainable London 2012, revealed that the sponsorship program was simply a pay to play charade. There were zero environmental standards that needed to be met in order to become a sustainability partner. The Rio Games bid promised to clean up the notoriously polluted Guanabara Bay by treating 80% of the water entering the bay. But this never happened. By the time the games began, around 169 million gallons of untreated sewage continued to flow into Guanabara Bay each and every day. For Pyeongchang, South Korean bidders promised that they deliver a Green Dreams Olympics featuring the most advanced environmentally friendly strategy. Then they chopped down 58,000 trees in a sacred 500 year old forest on Mount Dariwang to make way for an Olympic ski run. With Tokyo 2020, we may be witnessing the most greenwashed games ever. And this brings us back to Fukushima. While Olympic boosters hoisted the, recover, the recovery Olympics mantra into the media sphere, the situation in Fukushima remained grim. For our aforementioned visit to Fukushima in July 2019, we were accompanied by scientist and professor Fujita Yasumoto, who carried a handheld dosimeter, a device that measures external ionizing radiation levels. As we navigated through Fukushima prefecture, the dosimeter readings elevated, eventually reaching an apex at the TEPCO Decommissioning Archive Center and Museum, where radiation levels were 18 times higher than the recommended standard. As we traveled through the affected region, we passed roads barricaded by gates and guarded by police. These were the difficult to return zones where radioactivity was so high that the federal government prevented residents from returning. Even the fact that the Abe government has raised the allowable standard for exposure to radioactivity from the international benchmark of one millisievert annually to 20 millisieverts did not make the area safe for return. Residents who live in the area absorb well over the legal limit. Scientific American concluded Abe's determination to put the Daiichi accident behind the nation is jeopardizing public health, especially among children who are more susceptible. The Tokyo Olympics incentivize a rushed process to, to return residents to Fukushima, regardless of public health perils for the local population. In this context, Fukushima can be viewed as a sacrifice zone a term that emerged during the Cold War to denote a space made unlivable by nuclear fallout. Fukushima is a modern day capitalist sacrifice zone and one in which people are being forced to inhabit and perform in the name of the Olympic spectacle. A recent study in the academic journal Nature Sustainability examined recent Olympic games in regards to sustainability the study found that most Olympics fail to live up to their lofty sustainability promises. It also found that recent Olympics are some of the worst culprits, as you can see down here. Together, these Olympic downsides, which are ingrained features of hosting the Olympics, stoke what Rob Nixon theorizes as slow violence, or a violence that occurs gradually and out of sight, a violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space, an attritional violence that is typically not viewed as violence at all. The Tokyo Olympics in the context of the coronavirus allows us to more clearly see the slow violence in the ecological, social, and public health spheres. We are living in an unparalleled moment in the political history of the Olympics. Never have we seen such widespread disgruntlement on the part of the host country population. A recent Asahi Shimbun poll 
found that 83% of the population in Japan do not want the Olympics this summer. Recent years have brought an uptick in anti-Olympics activism across the globe. In Tokyo, two groups, Hunger and Nukai and Okotoa Link have been in the lead. In July, 2019, these groups teamed up with anti-Olympics activists from around the world for the first ever transnational anti-Olympic summit. The week-long series of events included strategy sharing sessions, public talks, and tours of Olympic areas. There was also a large mobilization in the Shinjuku district of Tokyo that garnered around 1,000 participants. Pangarin Nukai and Okotoa Link were joined by, dis by dissidents from recent host cities like Pyeongchang, Rio de Janeiro, and London, as well as future hosts like Paris and Los Angeles. The summit overlapped with the one-year mark before the original start date for the Tokyo Summer Olympics, 24th of July, 2020. The group No Olympics LA played a huge role in organizing the summit and in ongoing transnational activist efforts against the Olympics. These anti-games activists, are they're organizing under the slogan, No Olympics Anywhere no Olympics anywhere. They deserve a lot of credit for fighting for justice and against the odds in a lopsided battle against powerful entities in the Olympic system. Today, as I said, more than 80% of the population in Japan now agree with anti-games activists that the Olympics should not take place in Tokyo this summer. The next step anti-games activists suggest is to shift the argument to no Olympics anywhere. The International Olympic Committee holds the power to decide whether or not to cancel the Tokyo Olympics. One IOC power broker said that a decision on cancellation would need to be made by the end of June. That leaves a little more than two weeks for the people of Japan to publicly register their dissent against the Olympic project. In all my days studying the Olympics, I have never seen anything like what we are experiencing today. It is a rare chance to stand up to and have your voice heard. May I humbly suggest that this opportunity should not be squandered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Ms. Wada, thank you very much for your interpretation. And uh, Mr. Boykov and Mr. Utsunomiya, would you please stay? And we'd like to move to the next program. Boykov, Mr. Boykov's lecture was very clear. And we have, we are in the critical moment before the Olympics in Tokyo. And first of all, Mr. Utsunomiya spoke about the present situation of Tokyo under the pandemic. And there are various issues and which was caused by the pandemic. It's not only the virus which caused these issues. Holding the Olympics caused these issues. Not only, we are talking not only about the Tokyo Olympics, but it's kind of empire, IOC, like I will see Colonize Tokyo, kind of colonization is a very strong way to say, but it is true. So in that kind of a situation, what can we do? What can, how can we understand the situation? And in the introduction, I didn't say that, but uh, Mr. Barkov visited Japan two years ago and in the lecture of Mr. President, we saw that scene. He went to Fukushima by himself. And for these two years, how Japan has changed and how Japan has dealt with the preparation of the Olympics and what kind of problem we have. He really knows and it's very encouraging and very significant thing for us. So 
listening to his lecture, Mr. Utsunomiya, do you have any comment or any question? Listening to his lecture, the reason why we are calling for the cancellation, it was the spread of the COVID-19. And before that, Mr. Boyko was involved in the various activity because he knows the real issues of the Olympic itself. These four, you know, problems he mentioned in the lecture. IOC colonized the host city, that kind of structure problem we didn't understand so much deeply. So listening to his kind of talk, his speech, we really understand the kind of rooted problem, rooted issue, which the Olympic itself has. And another, because the spread of the COVID-19, we started to call for the cancellation. And during that period, I will see the attitude, kind of arrogant attitude. We are very hurt by that kind of arrogant attitude of IOC. Already Mr. Boykoff mentioned, and we they say we have to pay for it anyway. And the vice president also said, even under the state of emergency, Tokyo should have should have the responsibility to hold it. And even the Prime Minister Suga said Suga called for the cancellation. It is us we decide that such a kind of arrogant comment they repeated. Among us Japanese. For this kind of, you know, attitude of IOC, the arrogant way of IOC, and there is a kind of, you know, uh, sentiment against the IOC spreading among Japanese, I feel. So what do you think of it, Mr. Bao? So it's a kind of comment. <laughs> Uh, I would like to, uh, so you are talking about the IOC. Who are they? What are, going to, what are they going to do? We Japanese did not understand well, I think. So Mr. Boykoff, listening to his comment, would you please comment on Thank you. Let's talk about the International Olympic Committee. I think that's a great idea. The International Olympic Committee is an extremely privileged group of people. They were started by a Frenchman named Baron Pierre de Coubertin in the 1890s. So he was an aristocrat and he got together all his aristocrat buddies the counts, the dukes, the barons, and they started the Olympics. And they did not include women in the Olympics. The barons said that women were only there to place the laurels on the heads of the champions and also to produce baby boys who could one day become Olympians. It also excluded working people. If you were a bricklayer or you worked in a pub, you were considered a professional and you could not participate in the games. And so out of that exclusion was born a history of exclusion and a history of fight back from those excluded groups. It wasn't until 1981, you heard me right, 1981, that the International Olympic Committee began to include women among their ranks. And even today, 
more than 10% of IOC members are royalty. Now we have more princesses because they allowed women in and sheikhs from the Middle East, but the same principle holds. This is a group of privileged individuals. Not only that, but they've, accustomed, they've become accustomed to extreme privilege when they arrive in the host city. They expect fancy five-star hotels to stay in. They expect the finest food. They expect to be able to meet with the important people of the country. And they also get a per diem each day. If you're a member of the executive committee of the International Olympic Committee, your per diem that you get is $900 a day. So they could walk away from the Olympics making more than athletes who don't win medals at the Olympics, or even athletes who do win medals at the Olympics. And so I think uh, Mr. Utsunomiya is correct that identifying the IOC is a crucial part in dealing with this problem. They have way too much power. They have not enough accountability. They have almost zero accountability. And we've seen them trample all over people in Japan now, especially the last couple months, but you could argue all the way from the beginning if you think about it. So I agree the International Olympic Committee is important to talk about. IOC. Thank you very much. IOC is not the organization belong to the UN. It's not the organization uh, made by the government. It's just a NPO, great one. And I cannot understand that kind of organization. It's difficult to understand it. Mr. Boykoff, listening to his you know, talk, uh, speech, if you have any questions, please. I do, thank you very much. Um, my first question is, if you could talk a little bit about the reaction to your petition did the International Olympic Committee respond? Did the Japanese Olympic Committee respond? Did prominent politicians respond? I guess I'm just curious about how people in power responded and also how everyday people in Japan responded to the petition. Thank you. Uh, I already uh, mentioned it a little bit uh, in my speech. Since we started this petition on the net, for three days, we got 100,000 exceeded. And it was the fastest in record. And the number now over 420,000, the most we gathered. So not only in Japanese, but also other languages, you know, English, German, French, we are kind of sending the messages. So since the beginning, we started media, you know, uh, or kind of reported it. And I had the interview with 39 media agencies and uh, one third are from abroad. So about my petition, we, I started it gathered great attention from outside too. So as I reported before, in the middle of May, IOC and JOC, I kind of sent the written request calling for the cancellation, including the governor of Tokyo and the uh, Minister of the Olympics and uh, organi organizing a committee that had Ms. Hashimoto. However, the reaction, we have none. We had none reaction from these people. However, from ordinary people, ordinary Japanese people, we got lots of comments and uh, lots of you know, uh, response we got by fox, mail, various kinds of voices from medical workers because in the spread of COVID-19, medical, you know, uh, 
people are exhausted and they are very thankful for this campaign. And young people, when they reach the kind of adult, uh, because they, you know, the celebration of the holiday to become an adult was canceled. And also the sports meeting was canceled. However, not Olympics, the Olympics. Why it is so special? Such a kind of voice we are getting. And maybe it will, it is linking to the number of the signatures we are getting now. And in political stage, July 4th, we have the election of the gov gubernatorial election of Tokyo. And, and the issue is cancellation of the Olympics is a kind of focus. So Tokyo is a host city. So the governor, to governor Koike should focus on it in the election, even though she said it's safe and secure Olympics she's gonna make. Opposite party, most of them due to the COVID-19 spreading, Tokyo Olympics cannot make it. We should cancel it. Their policy, uh, most of the opposite party raised that policy. And myself, in Kitasenji in Tokyo, I'm also involved in the election campaign. And there, I'm kind of, you know, appealing the cancellation of the Olympic. And I'm also a candidate to appeal the cancellation. So opposition party, uh, this issue is giving the great influence. There are three issues. One, so it's a politically focused now. And next, second, why Olympic is exceptional? Most of the people questioned it. And another, as he said earlier, including media from abroad, there are strong reaction, much stronger than the reaction in Japan. So it's kind of difficult, you know, situation, difficult issue, Mr. Barkov. Uh, we have, you know, sponsorship for big business partners have the sponsorship with IOC. Why? There are three issues I mentioned. As I said, would you please comment on these three issues? Sure. So I would say for, for starters, um, let's start with the media issue. I think it's really interesting and important. And that's another thing that I wanted to ask you about, which is your assessment of the importance or lack of importance of Asahi Shimbun putting forth that editorial saying that the Olympics should be canceled. I think when we talk about the corporate sponsors of the Olympics, we should be careful to divide them out between the worldwide partners that have signed on to the International Olympic Committee, who've given millions upon millions of dollars to be official worldwide partners. So I'm talking about Coca-Cola, Airbnb, Alibaba, Panasonic, those kind of groups. They give millions upon millions and they're playing more of a long game. I would say just as a sort of middle point here, the Olympic movement, if you will, that's what they call themselves, are in the midst of the biggest crisis that we've seen in decades. If you put, look at what's happening with Tokyo right now, and then also only less than eight months down the road, Beijing is supposed to host the Olympics. An obvious human rights violator 
who is um, doing things that clash in obvious ways with the Olympic Charter. And so this is a real crisis period for the Olympics right now. And so if the worldwide partners will not break from the International Olympic Committee now or put pressure on them now, I'm not sure when they ever would. It seems like they're playing a long game and they're willing to stick by the International Olympic Committee. However, if we talk about local sponsors, that's sort of different. As people who are in this Zoom conversation will know, Japan and Tokyo organizers managed to put together the biggest slate of domestic sponsors in the history of the Olympics. More than $3 billion were collected. Now we all know that Dentsu played a huge role in influencing those companies, including media companies, to sign on to the Olympic project. But they have a very different set of incentive structures. Domestic sponsors have a different set of incentives. Those worldwide partners can wait it out. Those domestic sponsors, they seem to me to be more pushable into standing up against the Olympics because if they look out into Japan and they see 80% plus of the population does not want the Olympics, those are their consumers. Those are the people that buy their newspapers or products. And so, but whereas before it might've been popular to be associated with the Olympics because of the amazing athletes that come to the games, now it's not popular really at all to be associated with the Olympics. So it seems to me if I were in Japan, I wouldn't worry so much about Alibaba and Coca-Cola and them. I'd be focused on the domestic sponsors. You know, you were talking, um, Professor Ogasawara, about the state of exception being really important. And as you mentioned, I talked about it in my speech, my talk. But now I think it's fair to say we have a state of exception to the state of exception. We are in unparalleled territory in terms of the weakness of the International Olympic Committee historically, in terms of the percentage of the population in Japan that doesn't want the Olympics. And because of that, a lot of the traditional analysis no longer applies. And you might be able to put pressure on these local sponsors in the next few weeks to try to flip some of them and to, to speak out just like Asahi Shimbun did with that editorial. But I guess I would like to ask you, you two, or other people as well, um, do you believe that the Asahi Shimbun editorial was significant? Because when in the United States, it was played up as a significant moment. So, yes, 400,000 signatures, including Asahi Shimbun's editorial, ed and among the media. Looks like, you know, they have some, you know, opinions among uh, Mr. Utsunomiya mentioned the difficulty, uh, suffering of medical workers. And he heard the kind of voice from these people, not kind of sufficient kind of media things through the signature you know campaign the voice he got actually there should be a gap between the media reporting and the real people's voice what do you think of it media is also uh, you know listening uh, they started to listening to the medical workers' voices. For example, as I already mentioned a little bit, in Tokyo, Tachikawa City, and there is a Tachikawa General Hospital, they posted the poster saying, we are, we are forced to the limit, no Olympics. He's, they said, there are such similar appeals coming from medical workers and also doctors union in Tokyo. In the interview news conference, they also appealed no Olympics. So Tokyo newspaper reported it. He's, uh, it is not the sponsor, but uh, so that kind of direct voices 
we should listen to. No Olympics, no Tokyo Olympics. Mass media should summarize that voice to change our government. But however, it's difficult. And also the government should face the result of the petition. However, we cannot get that kind, that kind of reaction from the government. They, already, they always repeating the word safe and secure the Olympics we are gonna have. So the role of media is very important, significant. But as I said <clears throat> this time, what I questioned was Asaki, Yomiuri, Nikkei, these medias, they should watch the Olympics. However, they are sponsors. So it's very specific to Japan, or is it the kind of similar feature among the countries in the past? Uh, it's my question to Mr. Balikov. And I think, you know, media should not be the sponsors. And uh, I evaluate the result. There are some sports news uh, paper agency which did are not sponsors. Okinawa Times and New Shinipon Shinbun, they are against the Olympics. And the majority of the population calling for the cancellation, we found, you know, in the petition. And for the first time, Asahi newspaper agency uh, kind of raised the voice that they are against the Olympics. I evaluated that, but it should be earlier. It's a little bit late. So we are under the second state of emergency and now third state of emergency it continues. And there are many people who are suffering from that, you know, COVID-19 pandemic. And in that kind of situation, should we have, should we hold the Olympics? Media's role is in this. They should watch the Olympics itself. And uh, opinion, 80% are against the Olympics. There was no specific movement campaign for that. So our kind of petition, so it was well, a visible kind of you know campaign we did, I think. So they see, you know, The people who thought it, you know, Olympics should be held, these people's attitude, maybe we could have changed. And in the diet, the Mr. Edano said that the Olympics should be canceled. They, the opposite, uh, biggest opposite party started to say it. So I think, you know, our campaign, our petition worked for it. And even though the newspaper agencies and media abroad were criticizing the Olympics, however, uh, the media who could not raise their voices started to speak out. And in the diet, um, the biggest, largest opposite party started to say no to Olympic. So I think I can evaluate uh, our, you know, campaign when I saw these things. So in order to visualize what we, we are doing and we have to kind of, you know, review that we could not visualize so far in the past. Quality paper, these paper became sponsors. You know, do we have that these examples before? So, Mass media, yeah, yeah large thank papers. You. So let me first just say that, that I agree 100% that 
media outlets in the home country of the Olympic host should not be allowed to be sponsors of the Olympics because it sets up a conflict of interest should any conflicts or crises emerge around the games. And so there's a built-in incentive to not cover those if you're a sponsor or at least to downplay those. So I think we're on the same team on that one that these should not, going forward, that should not be the case. In terms of historical patterns, uh, there's been nothing quite like Dentsu in terms of having this force in society, a powerful force in society like Dentsu to organize all these media outlets and other domestic sponsors to create that much, 3 billion plus in sponsorships. We just haven't seen anything like that really in the history of the Olympics. Now, every Olympics has domestic sponsors, that is true, uh, but they tend not to be so much media outlets. The general pattern historically is that in the months leading up to and the years leading up to the Olympics, that typically is the space where you can have critiques of the games emerging Sometimes they're sort of boring, like will the venues get completed on time? But at other times they are more serious, raising questions around spending of money that could be spent on other things for society. Uh, or it could be critical coverage of the environmental damage that the Olympics are doing when they always are talking about they're doing environmental good. That's in the lead up to you'll see more critical coverage. Typically by the time we get a week or two in front of the Olympics, that's when the media in the host country and really the world tend to tighten up and not offer as much critical coverage. I want to just say, though, with the Tokyo Olympics, we are in uncharted waters, if you will. We're in a very different situation where I could see the, the critical media coverage that we're seeing in Japan, but also definitely around the world, continue all the way through the games, especially because the media will be covering how coronavirus plays out. We already know that one athlete arrived from another country, Kenya, a soccer player, who was tested positive for coronavirus once they arrived in country. That's going to happen when you have an Olympics with 11,000 plus athletes coming from 200 countries around the world, none of whom are required to be vaccinated. That is just a precursor of what is to come. And so that will lead to more critical coverage. In terms of getting out even wider in terms of the political history of the Olympics, I've been studying this for quite a while now. And I would say that the way the media coverage the, cover the Olympics in general has changed a lot. It's become quite a bit more critical. Back 10, 15 years ago, you could be a politician in a city who wanted to host the Olympics in their town. And you could stand up behind the podium and you could say, the Olympics are going to create jobs. They're gonna be wonderful and everyone's gonna have fun. And you wouldn't get that much pushback or difficult questions from the media. Today, that is not the case. If a city decides that they wanna have a bid, and let me be clear, it's not the city that decides, it's the elites, the rich people in a city decide that they wanna have the Olympics. I've never seen a grassroots group of people say, you know, working class people say, we want to have the Olympics. But anyways, when the elites of a city decide that they want to bring the Olympics to their town, nowadays, you can't just get away without that without having a bunch of journalists ask, asking tough questions. If you can't have activists popping up in these, in these various towns. And if you look at the recent history of the Olympics, whether it's Munich, Hamburg, Boston in the United States, Calgary, you name it, you have these anti-Olympics groups popping up and making it much more difficult. And that has changed a lot just over the last 10 years or so where that's become much more common. And so the long run of media coverage is trending to be more critical and realistic about the Olympics. Uh, whether that helps Tokyo, we will see. But I anticipate a lot more critical coverage during the Olympics in Tokyo than we've seen in any previous Olympic games. And that's just one last point. That's not even getting into the fact that the International Olympic Committee is tamping down on, they're squelching the rights of activists who might like to, of athletes who might like to become athlete activists at the Olympics. And they are saying because of a rule in the Olympic Charter that they cannot be activists at the Olympics. That could create a whole new wave of critical coverage if the Olympics happen 
if athletes become activists and if the International Olympic Committee tamps down and tries to stop them. That could create even more um, negative coverage that creates space for the kind of arguments that we're trying to have here today. Evidence-based, serious arguments that are critiques of the Olympics and demonstrate how they hurt everyday working people in each and every Olympic city. Thank you very much. Moika, uh, you both share the opinion. Mr. Boykov, his activities was a kind of representative activity uh, of the world of anti-Olympics. Uh, Even though the Utsunomiya's campaign was great, however, anti-Olympics has been continued. However, media didn't pick it up, I think. Maybe is it specific to Japanese society? Anti-Olympic movement and the present situation, how can we you know, link? It's very significant, important. And as Mr. Utsunomiya said, and national paper and local paper not, not national paper, local papers, tabloid, kind of, you know, paper. <laughs> no, people were a little bit are reluctant to pick it up. These smaller media are very active to criticize the Olympics. So this is the present situation of Japan. Mr. Utsunomiya continuously continuous, you know, movement that's boycotts and continued and the present situation, how can we connect? Do you think, Mr. Utsunomiya? As I earlier told, one thing in the pandemic, the issues are the issue of life and livelihood of ordinary people. Under the state of emergency, we have to stay at home. And uh, there are some people who cannot enter the hospital, who cannot be hospitalized. There are some who died at home. So Kyodo Tsushin collected the data. 70, 80 people died at home without getting the care. So if the medical, you know, site was not so exhausted, they could, they could have been helped. So when the Olympic was held in that kind of situation, there, there are, we should prepare enough, enough hospitals and beds. However, we, there are, is a great deficit, uh, deficit we, uh, we lack of beds and hospitals, as you know. So the issue of IOC, we understand the Olympic itself. I experienced the Olympic in 1964. At that time, most of the people welcomed it. And it was a very kind of, you know, uh, welcoming atmosphere. What is the significance of the Olympics? how it should be. Recently, and athletes themselves started to question it. They wondered, is it, is it, uh, it should, should it be held? with the risk of our lives. And there are some people who were not vaccinated. So when we think of the Olympic by just a, as a human being, we started to feel question. We started to doubt. Some athletes started to question the existence of the Olympic itself. So we wish the Olympic which should be welcomed by everyone. 
However, we have now started to have the voice against it. So there is a saying, athlete fast. But athlete themselves started to question it, whether we should have the Olympic as the risk of our lives. So how should we, the Olympic, how it should be? If we limit the number of participants, is it okay? And IOC families, they didn't limit the number according to them, uh, I mean, regarding them. So, so we, you know, Japanese people started to kind of, you know, lose the face in IOC. So even after the Olympics, that kind of question continue lingers, I think. So, so far, the people who continue the campaign of anti-Olympics, like Mr. Baikoff, and I read his book too, and I clipped the important part, and uh, that's anti-Olympic uh, anti movement will be spread into the world, in the world, I think. As I told you before, one more reason I have from May 5th, we started the petition. I also a representative of anti-poverty uh, network. And in the pandemic, many people lost the jobs. And as a result, there are many homeless people in Japan. And there are many people who are suffering from the poverty. So to help them, our group, at the end of the year or in the beginning of the year, during Golden Week, at that time, the people who could not get the support from the welfare related uh, agencies, we are delivering the food in the charge. And May 3rd and 4th, and there are 650 people gathered to get the food. And daily goods we deliver them too. According to the question, uh, request of them, of theirs, we also conduct, uh, we, con we also had a consultant with them. So they needed that kind of support. However, the support from the government side is very weak. Just only 100,000 yen they gave under the state of emergency. However, to the people, who are suffering from the poverty, they are not actually supporting. As, and also, as Mr. Boykoff already mentioned, huge amount of money poured into this event. Oh, exceeding three, uh, $730 billion. And this year, in Tokyo this year, fiscal budget. Would you please show? <laughs> would you please make it short? So uh, they prepare the money, 420 billion yen for the budget. If they have that kind of budget, why don't they give to the people who are suffering from the poverty? That's why I started this kind of, you know, uh, anti-poverty movement to help the people. And also, uh, we started the adult uh, restaurant to give the food to the poor. So, so the precious budget should be shared 
to the people who are suffering from the poverty. That's what I think. And that kind of idea should be continued. As Mr. Baikoff already said, Olympic itself has big issue in it. And we kind of, it's not just the problem at point, you know, at hand. The problem was rooted in the event, the game, the games itself. If our anti-Olympic movement can be linked with the movement of the boycott sun, it will be, it would have a stronger force. Maybe interpreter will be tired now. <laughs> I think it's a very important thing that you are talking about. Mr. Balkov, so far, anti-Olympic movement and the kind of rooted issues in the society due to the COVID-19, we can see clearly these issues together. And uh, specific poor or medical workers and the people uh, started to raise a voice and the government cannot help pick it up. Not watching the Olympic, but also the problem that we have in the world. We should take it as our own problem. It may be our start to do this. What do you think? Thank you. Um really interesting questions and comments. And so if I could start with the COVID-19 situation, I very much view COVID-19 as similar to when you go to the doctor and they inject dye into your body so that they can better see the organs and the bones inside of you. COVID-19 is that injection of dye into the Olympic body. And because we're now able to see the Olympic body with much more clarity, it's a lot easier to see that there are serious problems in the Olympics physique, if you will, ingrained problems that I was talking about before. So COVID-19 has allowed more people in the world to see with greater clarity what the Olympics are about, even when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. And the issue of athletes has come up a little bit in the conversation here. And it's also come up, I noticed in the chat. And you mentioned uh, Mr. Utsunomiya that the slogan of athletes first that the International Olympic Committee and others have used, athletes first. And you have to wonder if athletes are truly first when you look at the playbooks that the International Olympic Committee has issued thus far. Now they will issue a third set of playbooks in the coming days here. But the ones that were issued before make it very clear that when it comes to the athlete playbook, that all risk is being placed on the backs of athletes. In fact, an athlete who is bound to go to Tokyo to participate in the Olympics reached out to me behind the scenes and shared with me the document that this individual was being asked to sign in order to participate in the Olympics. The person sent me the document and I looked at it and I just was like, wow, this is jaw dropping. Not for a lot of the provisions. I mean, as a former athlete, I've signed many waivers in my time. So it wasn't about most of it, but a couple lines really jumped out at me as important. And one of those said in this waiver, basically, that this individual is being asked to sign, that if this person died from COVID-19 or from the heat in Japan, that the International Olympic Committee and Tokyo organizers would not be responsible, that the athlete could not sue anybody. They couldn't sue the IOC or the JOC or anyone for that matter. And that just jumped out at me as bracing as cold hearted. And it sure didn't sound like athletes first. In fact, it, it sort of sounded a lot like 
athletes last to me. <laughs> and I think we've seen that time and again with these Olympics, and we've actually seen it at previous Olympics. The question about athletes speaking out. We've seen the wonderful tennis player, Naomi Osaka, speak out publicly and wonder aloud whether the Olympics should transpire during a pandemic. We've seen uh, Kei Nishikora uh, also speak out about this. Those athletes tend to be athletes who make more money, so they are financially insulated. There are a lot of athletes from lesser known sports for whom the Olympics are their one chance to make some money, to become famous, to get an international sponsor that will allow them to continue their career. We have athletes in the United States who make it to the Olympics only because they start GoFundMe fundraiser pages online. And that's how they get the money to make it to the Olympics. For them, from lesser known sports, the Olympics are their one chance. And so I guess I would just say that the Olympic athletes deserve a much bigger slice of the Olympic money pie. Let me just say one last thing on this point, And that is, there was a really important study done by Ryerson University that compared the amount of revenue that Olympic athletes get directly from the Olympics and those athletes from the National Basketball Association or the National Football League or the National Hockey League or Major League Baseball or the English Premier League of Soccer in England. And in all those other leagues, athletes earned about 45 to 60% of the revenues from those leagues. 45 to 60% went into the pockets of athletes. With the Olympics, Olympians only make 4.1% of the revenues that the IOC, the International Olympic Committee makes, 4.1% compared to 45 to 60%. And so I don't know how you can argue that athletes are first under that kind of system. It very much feels like athletes are last there. And I think that there, there's an area where we could see some at, more athletes speaking out, especially the ones who are financially insulated like Naomi Osaka. And that to me could be really interesting at these games. Mm. Exactly. Thank you very much. And I think both of your speeches were very impressing. I have to finish just enough in five minutes now. So last question for both from Mr. Utsunomiya, poverty issue. It was not visualized so far. However, with pandemic and the Olympics, we could see the issues now and the people started to voice, speak out. And Boykostan, Mr. Boyko said, he described the situation of the athlete in the Olympics and they started to raise the voices too. So from SN SNS, we could hear their voices too. We didn't understand, we didn't know their situations. We are finding the real situation. So there are issues that we are facing now and we could request the reform or review to the government or a deal with the problem. And then, is it okay to have the Olympic? Is it better to have the Olympic? Because it was a kind of, you know, starter to visualize these issues. By doing the Olympics, we could, we started to understand the issues present at present. And is it the meaning or a significant meaning of the Olympics, that kind of way of thinking there will be. Some people may think that way. Lastly, I'm sorry, the time is limited, just for one minute. How do you think about this? Can I have comment? Starting from Mr. Utsunomiya. Poverty and the gap between the rich and the poor due to the COVID-19 in pan pandemic and also the exhausted medical workers and the people are dying. 
in order to visualize these issues, it's better to have the Olympic, that kind of, you know, way of thinking. I kind of, it's, it's strange. It's illogical to think that way. The important is to is how to deal with these issues rather than not having the Olympics. In the pan pandemic itself, visualize the issue in the society. However, the po poverty, a gap poverty, a gap between the rich and the poor was spreading in front of us. We should have interested in that issue first and pouring huge amount of money into the games. Is it okay? We should use that money for, to, for solving these issues at hand. Very clear. Mr. Boykoff. So pushing ahead with the Tokyo Olympics could open up additional space for critiquing the Olympic machine. For me, the scenario that could be most devastating to the Olympics more generally would be if COVID rates begin to rise sharply in Japan and the International Olympic Committee continues to insist that they have to happen. And then the Japanese government says, we can't hold these Olympics, we wanna cancel them. And the International Olympic Committee says, okay, well, we're going to sue you and we're going to take you to court and you're going to lose a ton of money and this is going to be a nightmare for you. That could be the worst case scenario for the Olympics, best case scenario for people who have long been opposing the Olympics because it lays it all bare, the fact that it really is economics that drives the Olympic juggernaut. It is money all the way. Uh, the International Olympic Committee receives 73% of its money from broadcasters, like in the United States where I'm coming from, NBC. 73% of the money of the IOC comes from broadcasters. Another 18% of their money comes from corporate sponsors. And so that means nine out of every $10 that rolls into the coffers of the International Olympic Committee, that rolls into their bank account, comes from those two entities. They don't really much care, it seems, what people in Japan have to say about their project. They can ignore them so long as the money flows in from those other two sources. But if we see a situation in Tokyo where people continue to resist the idea of the Olympics and the International Olympic Committee rams ahead, we could see a situation where the Olympics receive such reputational damage uh, that it becomes difficult to proceed or it's a pivot point in the history of the Olympics, when more and more people will just say, no, we don't want these coming to our town. Both of them, uh, both of you, thank you very much. Time is limited. I'm sorry about this in the middle way. Uh, I would like to continue more, but uh, we will stop now and have the break time, break. And we will go into the question and answer time. And during the break, we will choose the questions. And both of you are going to answer the questions that we gathered. Thank you very much. Are you ready for question and answer time? Mr. Ukai will read up the questions. Mr. Boykoff and Mr. Utsunomiya, thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. Time is limited, so I'd like to read the question on the in the chat. Some we chose. I'd like you answer it or comment. And uh, Mr. Boykoff commenting on the playbook, even though it is said the artist first, athlete first, but the reality is artist, athlete last. And during the Olympic game, the money which is given to the athlete is so small amount. We were very surprised at the, that's the reality. We didn't know about it. So, 
listening to Mr. Boykoff's, you know, comment, Mr. Utsunomiya, about your peti uh, petition. What kind of, you know, reaction did you get? I'd like to ask you first. After that, to Mr. Barkov, because you are a former soccer player and you participated in the Olympics. So to the Olympics, do you, uh, I think, you know, the spotlight will be on the athletes someday. Athlete also has a responsibility for the society. How can we ask that responsibility for the athlete? Because this movement, you know, it involved that thing, you know, also. So if you can give the comment or advice, we are happy. From Mr. Utsunomiya, can we have? As for my petition, you know, from the athlete side, yeah, to me, directly, there was none. So, however, the, as a starter of the anti Olympic among the athlete, as uh, Mr. Nishikori or Shintani san, Miss Shinya, like them, we started to hear the comment from the athlete side. And as a starter of my petition, I don't know even. I don't know if there is any link with it, but the famous, you know, swimmer, uh, you should reject to participate in the Olympics. That kind of, you know, respond she got from the ordinary people. The voice to cancel the Olympics, that kind of, you know, voice should be toward the IOC or a JOC organizing a committee, committee, not to the athlete himself or herself. <clears throat> so I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens when the International Olympic Committee issues its third and final set of playbooks, will there be anything that will make athletes feel more comfortable or will it just make athletes more stressed out? If you look at the previous athlete playbook, it's a lot of what we might call hygiene theater, wear a mask, uh, stay away from people, wash your hands. Everybody knows this at this point. And crucially, all responsibility and risk is placed on the athlete's shoulder. That could spur some athletes to be more inclined to speak out against the Olympics if they or when they go to Tokyo. Now, personally, I do not think that every single athlete has the responsibility to speak out against the Olympics. I'm just being realistic here. Because as a former athlete myself, I know that to reach a high level, you have to be very focused on your sport. And not all athletes are going to follow the political machinations around the Olympics. They might not follow that carefully that 80% plus in Tokyo don't, and in Japan don't want the Tokyo Games. So I don't hold it against an athlete if they choose not to become an athlete activist. I get it. And in fact, we probably don't want some athletes to become athlete activists if they're not ready, because who knows what they would say. I know I wouldn't have wanted to see myself as a 19-year-old athlete activist when I was playing for the U.S. Olympic soccer team. That I wouldn't want to see that. But here's where I do think we might see leadership from athletes. First of all, as I mentioned before, 
from athletes who are more insulated financially. So all those players that will be coming to the Tokyo Olympics from the National Basketball Association, they all make tons of money. They don't need the Olympics. The Olympics needs those athletes. If they were to speak out against what they're seeing in Tokyo, that could be extremely powerful. I know from experience that Olympic athletes who tend to reach out to me behind the scenes and want to talk about the issues that I raise or just want to bump some ideas off of me, they tend to be older athletes. So I think if you're out there and, and you know older athletes, you could talk to them and maybe even present them with some facts about the Olympics that might turn them to speak more critically about them. So I would say that not all athletes should be athlete activists. They can be a powerful lever for change. And the last thing I'll say is we don't need to look any further than when the Tokyo Olympics were postponed in the first place. Back in March, 2020, Tomas Bach of the International Olympic Committee was saying that the International Olympic Committee was not even uttering the words postponement or cancellation. They weren't even uttering them. So setting aside the fact that that is incredibly irresponsible, only a few days later, the Olympics were postponed. Well, why? It was because individual athletes around the world started to stand up and question whether it was going to be safe to hold those Olympics. Then you had USA Swimming, USA Track and Field that were speaking publicly, wondering whether these games should transpire. Then you had athletes from Canada, the National Olympic Committee from Canada that said, if the Olympics were held in the summer of 2020, they would not send their athletes. So it was a de facto boycott, if you will. They were followed by Australia, Germany, Portugal. So who would have predicted that? I certainly wouldn't have. And so with COVID-19, with the Olympics being in such disarray, so much is possible and is on the table. And maybe athletes might play a role, but I don't necessarily personally hold it against them if they don't speak out as much as I wish they might. Thank you very much. Movement, campaign, and academic researches, the term used in them without direct conversation will be conveyed to the athletes, I think. Uh, I got many comments in chat. Athlete has a responsibility for the society. There is a comment and it may be a kind of good theme. Thank you very much. Next question, please. I cannot hear. A next question to Mr. Utsunomiya. Over 400,000 signatures you gathered. Based on that proposal to cancel the Olympics, do you, can you take any legal action if there was loss or damage? Are there any legal action that we can have and to whom we should kind of appeal? As a lawyer, can I have advice or a suggestion? Legal action and legal procedure, we'd like to ask. I think the proposal to our provisional disposition can be proposed. However, as a kind of you know, part of the movement of a campaign, no demonstration. However, the people who against the 
Olympic. There are people who are against it. And uh, as, a, as a part of movement, we can propose a provision disposition. Several years ago in Tokyo, there was a transplant, uh, trans movement of the place, site, move, site movement. And the Tokyo proposed a kind of, you know, provision disposition to Tokyo. However, it was announced in media. However, the court didn't pick it up. So it may be difficult for the court to stop it legally. However, there is a benefit to propose it because you can visualize the movement campaign. However, preparation for that kind of legal action is very difficult and very tough to do. So maybe the petition will be easier to do. So it just has a kind of, you know, meaning as a movement, as a campaign for the loss and damage of the Olympic compensation we can propose. However, it's very difficult. The career cause we have to give the evidence ignoring there was a case uh, the people who got positive in COP19 can propose appeal the court targeting the government. However, kind of technical, clear evidence we should provide. If directly, it, if it is a direct cause of the infection, that kind of thing we should prove. So as a result of the Olympic, it may be a little bit difficult to uh, provide the evidence. However, it is beneficial as a part of the movement. Not only the infection issue, there may be our issue of deficit. And also we have to cover it by our taxes. And that kind of legal action can we take for that kind? Maybe possible, yeah. However, in detail, how much we spent, we have to clarify how much money we could get and to what we spent. That's kind of document we should keep and that we have government keep it, keep the record. We should have the government keep the record. Already, the Olympic is at the corner. Long time ago in Colorado State, in Denver, Tokyo Olympic kind of, he, uh, it rejected the host right, right to host the city, host city. Can you explain a little bit about this case, Mr. Baikoff? <clears throat> Thank you, yes. So it's a fascinating moment in Olympic history. As Professor Ogasawara mentioned, Denver was the host of the 1976 Winter Olympics. However, people in Denver and around Denver from across the political spectrum came together and said, we don't want to pay for the games. And so you had fiscal conservatives on one hand, and then you had more liberal environmentalists on the other hand, who came together and created a public referendum that put, was put on the ballot and people overwhelmingly voted against having the Olympics, against having any public money put into the Olympics. Once the people of the area won that vote and the Olympics lost, 
the International Olympic Committee knew that they had to move the games elsewhere. And they moved them to Innsbruck, Austria. That's why you've never heard of the 1976 Denver Olympics because they never happened. So what I think is important about that is twofold. One, when you're putting together a group of people who are against the Olympics, you might have people that are politically quite dissimilar. They're very different. You might have people that are concerned about fiscal matters that are very conservative, along with people that are concerned about the issues that Mr. Utsunomiya has raised, like poverty and homelessness. You can actually get those people together to fight against the Olympic Games. Second of all, you just never know what's going to happen if you get the public involved. I think that's the second lesson from that. And you know, as we approach the games in Tokyo, like I said, I've never seen anything like this moment in Olympic history where so much is undecided and where so much power has been shifted into the hands of the people in the host country. I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking about mm -hmm. only a few weeks until the Olympics are supposed to happen. Only a few weeks for people in the country to stand up to the International Olympic Committee and their very unfair and lopsided host city agreement and to stand up in public and push back against those powerful entities. I mean, I have never seen anything like this and I wonder what's going to happen. I'm really interested to see what's going to happen in Japan. And I think we really need to thank the anti-Olympics activists in Japan from Okatoa Link and from Hangarin no Kai who've created space for people to stand up in public against the Olympics. Now is the time. You're never probably ever gonna have a chance to do this again, to stand up to the powerful entities of the International Olympic Committee. So if you're not going to do it now, I'm not really sure when you would ever want to do it. I would, if I lived in Japan, I'll tell you what, I would be standing out there in the streets, making my voice known to the public, making my voice known to the International Olympic Committee, making my voice known to the government in Japan. Thank you very much. I, listen, uh, I could hear you. Next question. Very significant, very important one. Looking at the new comments I'm looking at, it's a kind of complex procedure to do. Now I'm looking for it here. In Japan, centering Tokyo, a lots of huge number of elementary school kids are more to be mobilized for the Olympics. It's very important issue. So there are two people question it. Mr. Utsunomiya. How about centering the elementary school kids, canceling of the Olympic movement, we should raise, we should start. Because, because they are very susceptible people. And I'd like to add one more question. In Tokyo, from 2016 to all schools, Olympic and Paralympic education was, became a subject to cover. There are students who dislike sports. However, they, the government want to decrease the number of these kids. So this kind of Oripara education, not only in Tokyo, but in many places of the of Japan, it's now spreading to the people who raise the voice against the Olympics. There, there are some discrimination going on. So it's not a question, but a comment though. So this issue, Olympic and Paralympic education allotted for 35 hours. 
It's related to the right of children. Why? It's a kind of required subject, including that kind of Oripara education to Mr. Boykoff, to junior high school and elementary school kids, mobilization of these kids. Are there any example before? For the COVID-19 issue for the kids, there are many serious problems from the school uh, pushing that kind of, you know, required subject. It's a great issue. And there is a voice coming to cancel it, to stop it. So in this pandemic, there is a kind of threat of infection among children. And um, so it's a very problematic issue, I think. In gubernatorial election, there are many things which should be focused on. LDP, the governing party and opposite party. The candidate from opposite party are mostly anti-Olympics. And they would like to focus on it in the election, including this required subject issue. So furthermore, debate should be going on. So Mr. Baikoff, in America or in other countries, targeting elementary school kids or a junior high school kids, mobilization of these kids. Are there any examples so far in the history? Thank you. I mean, what we're really talking about here is propaganda. And my guess is much of the education that students in Japan are receiving is pro-Olympics propaganda. And I would be all in favor of education of young people if they were able to talk about the ideas that we've been talking about tonight to have a more truthful and well-rounded assessment of the Olympics. That could be really healthy for young people that it would allow them to think critically about what's happening right now in their country. Unfortunately, I don't think that that's what's actually probably happening in the schools in Japan. Instead, they're getting a dose of pro-Olympics propaganda. And that's common in every single Olympics to different degrees moving forward. I haven't heard about um, specific programs like in the United States when we've hosted that is forced curriculum on teachers like that. But there's no question that teachers are bringing the Olympics into their teaching. The question is, how do they do it? Um, what is taught in the curriculum is what actually matters. And I second the concern around young people if they're being asked to uh, go to the Olympic Games and fill up the stands at some of these events, the more that people travel um, in the country, the more dangerous the possibilities become in terms of transmission for coronavirus. Because you're a, a child and you might not show symptoms of it, that doesn't mean you can't be a carrier of coronavirus and then go back home and, and give it to your parents or your grandparents. That can be a very dangerous proposition, sending these young people into Olympic venues to en enjoy the Olympics if they allow the uh, students to do that. They allow any visitors into, these, into the um, matches. So I think that what is taught matters. And if it's just pro-Olympics propaganda, then no one's really benefiting as a thinker, as somebody who learns about the complexities of the world. Um, there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it. Thank you very much. One thing that I would like to confirm, IOC program, the most important was uh, education, 
for the Olympic once in four years to continue the games we should educate the people that kind of idea so it, it may be easy for the government to find the purpose i'd like to add thank you very much for your comment and ta we have no time i'd like to pick it up one more Abroad news agency, there are some journalists attending in the meeting, who are attending in the meeting, and we got the opinions from them too. So, I'd like to summarize it. As Mr. Boykoff already said, in Japan, Asahi Shimbun getting the result of 80% of the population is against the Olympic. They started to raise the voice against the Olympic. The image of democratic Japan may be bothering where is the risk some people don't know and the political situation around the olympic in abroad they do not understand that kind of situation in japan so from two years ago as for tokyo olympic uh, mr boykov has been studying so i'd like to have your comment on it In America, ordinary people, the, what is how they are thinking about this situation? From Mr. Boyko first, and next maybe Mr. Utsunomiya, if you have briefly. So the question is, how are people in the United States viewing what's happening with Tokyo and the Olympics more generally? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, it's interesting. In the United States, there has been a growth of critical thinking around the Olympic Games. I think it's fair to say, though, that the Olympic Games are popular in the United States so long as they're not happening in your city. And I feel like that is the dynamic that we're now seeing around the world. The Olympics are popular because the athletes are wonderful, but they're not popular if they're happening in the city where you happen to live. And I think what I've noticed in the United States is that there's a rising criticality when it comes to discussing the Olympics. I think that the activists in Boston who rejected the bid for the 2024 Olympics helped a lot to raise up a lot of the concerns around the Olympics. Those same concerns are now being extended in the activist battle in Los Angeles, where you have a really smart group of talented activists, many of whom are rooted in Hollywood and communications and journalism, who are pushing back against the Olympics there. So I think that the way the Olympics in general are talked about is more critical right now in the United States. In terms of how people are talking about the Tokyo Olympics, I think in general, there's just a general deferral to the people who actually have the power in this decision. And that the people who have the power is the International Olympic Committee. And there might be some perception here that the Tokyo organizers and that the Japanese government has more power than they actually do. Um, right now, there's fairly, uh, I would say, idle observation coming from the United States. And people are more concerned as to whether the Olympic athletes will be able to attend from the United States. So I would say, like, on one hand, it's criticality. On the other hand, just looking out for what's going to happen with the athletes should they make it to Tokyo 2020. Thank you very much. Mr. Utsunomiya? Hello. Japanese society as a country, when we think about Tokyo, there is a tendency to follow 
kind of, you know, all the people in a group. So the view from the abroad was that kind of view. Japanese people are kind of, you know, tended to act as a group. And uh, however, there was a voice raising against the Olympics. And um, Okinawa, uh, sorry, Japanese people have been suffering from many disasters so far. And small business bankrupted and um, not regular workers are suffering more. They are losing the jobs and they are displaced. And they became homeless now. A huge number of people coming from that. And also there are requests of shutdown of the business. However, it's, it, it is not unified well. And some companies already bankrupt. And it is difficult for small business companies to continue the business. And uh, this kind of situation we suffered for almost more than a year and a half. And the government did not do what they have to do. So in order to prevent the more spreading of the COP19, what we should do, the Olympic itself is doing the things contradict dicting thing with this situation because you know as you already see elementary kids if they brought into the venue they are in the threat of the infection of the COVID-19 in order to prevent the infection we are now have the stricter measure, anti-measure, anti-COVID-19 COVID measure now. The governor of Chiba and many other prefectures started to say that we are going to boycott the torch relay or public viewing. And even though the government always requests the stores to shut down, to close. However, exception is always the Olympic. So the uh, in abroad, news media did not realize this, I feel. So many people are suffering in pandemic, losing their jobs. And it's long time period, a long period of time we are in that kind of situation. We cannot welcome the Olympic to resist that kind of a situation. And the view of IOC and arrogant attitude of the IOC members, we Japanese started to feel that they are not sharing our sufferings. So, so we are very kind of starting to notice about that, you know, gap between Japanese people's feeling and the IOC's attitude. I was asked, you know, if the, are there any, you know, uh, attack by from the by the other side, because you know. Japanese society always following what government said, even though, uh, however, you are against it. Are there any, you know, attack from the opposite side? I was asked. Um, however, it, it was a small number. So it means majority of Japanese people are sharing our view. So I'd like to ask, you know, abroad medias to understand this situation in Japan. Thank you very much. 
dissent policy started. There are many people who are against the Olympics. Why? Sorry, it's time to close. I was in charge of uh, selecting the questions. I started to think seriously about these issues and uh, news media in abroad, I'd like to tell them in the opinion of the people, there was a kind of comment. It just looked like similar of the kind of policy just before the World War II, Japanese attitude before the World War II, kind of parallel we see. That kind of comment we have now. Abroad, the leaders of Japan have not changed yet, have not changed a bit. So, even though there is a strong, you know, force to against the Olympic, even to the war, can we resist to the war too? If, if you know, if the host city regard the Olympic was successful, maybe they would go toward the reversion review of the peace constitution. It is clear to see. So I wonder if the media abroad understand this too. If this kind of situation continued, uh, I wonder if IOC takes the same attitude toward other countries too. Is it a kind of special uh, kind of, you know, attitude looking down on Asian people? I started to feel that way too. So it was a very significant uh, time to have your views here. We should continue this kind of opportunity and we should continue our debate to raise our voice against the Olympics. Thank you very much for your participation. Is that all? Yeah, I'm satisfied with this role. As for the movement I'm involved in, I will write down in chat and there are some comments on it. And there are some anti-Olympics meeting are planned. 23rd, next 23rd, we have various kinds of activities. So please watch them. Thank you very much. Question and comment. Thank you very much. I we appreciate it, and uh, we'd like to give it to the speakers, both of you, Boykov san Mr. Boykov, and Utsunomi, Mr. Utsunomiya. Thank you very much, and interpreter, Mr. Ikeda, Miss Ikeda, and um, Miss Matsuda, and Mr. Miss Wada. Thank you very much for your hard work. <laughs> thank you very much. Also, we really appreciate the listeners who participated in the meeting. I don't know if we have time enough. However, one more thing that I would like to say, if the Olympic was forced at the last moment, when and where, who said what, we should watch carefully and record it so that we can exactly review what happened later on. So it could be a very good starter, 
you know, this meeting. Let's meet again sometime, somewhere. Thank you very much. We'd like to close the meeting. Mr. Barkov, thank you very much. But Mr. Barkov, thank you very much. Uh, if I, if we have a chance, we'd like to. Uh, I'd like to see you again. That sounds great. I'd love to. Thank you for all of this. It's been a real honor to participate tonight. Thank you.